we're in a passage that I'm doing studies off from, which is James 1, 12 through 15. But today we're looking at, because verses 12 deals with our subject matter over a period of a few weeks is a testing in the Christian life. I'm going to pause for a little bit in that study to do some special studies from it. Verse 12, you, you, you'll notice in verse 12, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial for once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's testing by God. That's a positive thing in a, in a believer's life. And we, we talked about that. For example, undeserved suffering. Uh, one of those categories that James has been talking about in chapter one, like verses two through four. <clears throat> and it's rewardable. Uh, suffering in the Christian life, we call it undeserved suffering, is will pay, we'll, we'll pay off, if not in time, for sure in eternity with a crown of life and other rewards. Today in verse 13, we're looking at a second area. There are three areas of testing. Verse 12 is testing by God. Verse 13, testing by Satan. Verse, 13, verse 14 and 15, testing by the lust of the sin nature. So in verse 13, let no man say when he's tempted... I am being tempted by God. Notice that's a saying. Notice that. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. That's an absolute. For God, and this is the reason why we should not say that, because God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone with evil. That's the point. Therefore, who does tempt us with evil? The evil one. One of the titles of Satan uh, is the evil one. <clears throat> and so our subject matter today is about testing by Satan, the evil one. Notice, <clears throat> he's not, not talking about sin here. We're talking about evil. Evil. The, the source of sin is not Satan. The source of sin, <clears throat> the source of sin is within the believer, that's verse 14 and 15. <clears throat> but the source of evil, and we'll talk about how evil attacks the revealed. You can always tell when it's, when it's hit your life because it's in conflict with what has been revealed to you as a directive will of God. And it's in conflict. It gets, it gets in conflict what you know to be revealed truth in your life. It's evil because it's attacking the revealed will of God. We're familiar with Adam and Eve. It, the directive goes out. Well, let me have a word of prayer. My engine's starting. I need that word of prayer with you. Give you a moment of silence as a believer, priest, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin. And because you can't, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study it in carnality, nor can you apply it in carnality to your life. Therefore, it's a spiritual book. You need to be spiritual when you study it and when you apply the word. 1 John 1 9, carnality is identified as personal sin. 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. It becomes your responsibility to examine, for example, mental attitude sins, confess it. Sins of the tongue, confess it. Overt sin, confess it. That's the point of 1 John 1, 9. Because if we do confess our sins, or when we do, then he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That gives you proper procedure, not only to learn the Bible, but to apply it. Let us pray. Well, Father, how thankful we are for the opportunity to be part of freedom of this great nation, America. You know what, made, what has made America great is God. It's not politics. It's not a position we hold. It's who holds the position. It is God who holds the supreme position. And we're thankful to know that, Father, in our hearts. We do left our nation before you, Father, and pray they would come back to God. A nation needs to come back to God. It needs to be the, the primary topic discussions in the highway and the hedges and all the administrative offices including our schools and everything else. 
the enemy would like to tell you, then, uh, you know, we have God too, and we need to have a part of it. Oh, really? Listen, I'm all, I'm all for, Father. I'm all for Elijah going on the mountain and, and having a contest with the, with the prophets of Baal. Because God will always win. God will always win because there is only one God. Although there are many religions spouting all different kinds of things. And that is based on Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray that uh, today we would look at the, th the, the principle of who tempts us with evil. How do we combat it? And how do we correct it? For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are. Last week, we talked about testing by God. Today, we're going to talk about testing by Satan. And of course, you know what we're going to talk about next week. Uh, that's a heads up because we'll be there at 14 and 15. T Listen, what the writer says in verse 13 is very interesting when you break it down. When you break verse 13 down, you find something. Here's a false assumption and a true, a true doctrine. A false assumption and a true doctrine. That's always the angelic conflict. Always the angelic conflict. As soon as truth is revealed as truth, then there's a conflict over it because that's not what the world, this cosmic system world is about. The cosmic system is to disguise lying as truth. As uh, disguise evil as good. Uh, and so he's a, a cunning master at deception. We should not be ignorant of those. But here's the false assumption. Let no man. This is a real interesting word because it's used twice. And I want you to notice. See the word let no one. See medesis. Medesis. Now that's an interesting word because it's made up of three Greek words. Now look down below. I'll show it to you in a moment. Look down on the true doctrine. That's connected with the false doctrine. Look down at the. And the word anyone, see odesis, see that? O-U-D-E, listen. See, M-E, the M-E on up there in a false assumption, no, let no one. The M-E, that's a negative. That's not. And ook, see the O-U, that's part of ook. That's O-U-K. That's a negative. Then you have D-E, that's a conjunction day. And then you have the word heis, which is one. This makes, it's a triple compound word. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting word, and it's used in two negatives. The first one in the false assumption, let no one, let no one. It, and here's what it means. it means. It means no, not one. That's pretty strong. Let no one. That may sound like, well, let no one. Uh-uh. This says... I mean, no, not one. I don't care who you are. No, I don't care if you're the Pope or the preacher. No, not one. Let no one say this. Let no, not one. Okay? Let no one say, lego, and notice it's, a, it's an imperative. That's a present active imperative. See the word say? That's a command. Not one of you, and he puts in a command, say, no one, not one, never, say. So that's very strong, say. It's all connected together, and it's very strong. Uh, notice that the medesis, the no one, notice that's nominative, singular, masculine. That's, that's a subject. It's used as a subject. Let no one, I mean not one, ever say. See how strong that is? Strong. I want you to get how strong that is. Let no one say, when he is tempted, there's our parazzo, that's our subject matter, that's, that's the marker that's in all, all of this, tempted. The word parazzo is either used in our passage, either used, translate, either is translated tempt, or trial. Let no one say when he's tempted, there it is, present active participle, that, and this is what they're saying. You can't see the H-O-T-I, but it's in the Greek. And it's there 
with a, a verb of saying to tell you. In other words, it's quoting. It's quoting. Saying, I am being tempted. There's our word again. Parazzo, present active participle. Let no one say when he's tempted, quote, I am tempted by God. All right? This should be an explanation, shouldn't it? Right? Because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's been declared. It's, it's with the imperative. Let no one say, I am being tempted by God. Okay? Then he goes on and tells you why in a moment. I am not. Now, here's what's what interesting about this word, by. See the little word by? That's a preposition. That's apo plus the ablative of source. That if you're tempted by evil, God is not the source of evil. God is the source of good, not evil. Let no one say that when you're tempted, I am tempted by God to do evil. That's not true. That's a lie from Satan. That's one of his ways of deception. All right? So there's a false assumption. Some people are saying that. Agreed? Some are saying that. That's a false assumption. Then here's the true doctrine. For, that's a casual particle. That's a casual uh, uh, particle. And it means because. Because. That it's why. Why, why this... Uh, because, for, or because, God is untemptable. Notice that you end with tempted. Notice, see the A on the front of the word? Look at the Greek word. It's got an alpha privative on the front of the word, and then you can see the word peras, see, see perastas, the agent of it, the source of it. That T-O-S means the source of it. That's an alpha, untemptable. Because God is untemptable. It's not part of his character, never has been, never will be. Don't let anybody lie about it. Untemptable. Notice, for God is untemptable with evil. Ablative of source. He is never, he is never the source of evil. It's evil to even say it. And he himself, God alone, the God standing on his character alone, God alone does not tempt, parazo, anyone. And he comes back to this word, uk de heis, a triple compound. It means the same way. This is never true. It will never be true. It is not part of the character of God. It is a lie from Satan. Because it, the character of God, it can't even be any aspect of it can be part of the character of God. It's pretty strong stuff. God is not a God of evil. He is a God of good. Okay? Let me show you something. Look at Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 12 with me. Here's what you see with Paul. He's been in a subject about the mind, haughty in mind, and never pay back evil with evil to anyone in verse 17. Never take vengeance. Be at peace with all people. Your enemy. But in then any talk, then, it, then in verse, he closes out chapter 12, which is really a big chapter. He closes the chapter out with this statement. Verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's God good. That doesn't mean good works. That does good from human standpoint. 
that is bringing God into that, that mix where only God and his goodness can overpower evil. Only God's goodness overpowers evil. You understand that? Listen, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with God's goodness. God does good, does not do evil. What conquers evil is God's goodness. God's goodness conquers Satan's evil. And Tony talked about that a little bit this morning. So I want to talk in this morning, I want to talk about four things, four aspects of how Satan tempts believers and how to defeat them. I'm going to tell you, I mean, how he, how he works uh, how he works us, and I'm going to tell you how not to let him work you. All right? Point number one. The key issue presented in our lesson text regarding testing, and I'm talking about the greater, the greater context, not just my verse, but the greater. I'm talking about chapter, verse 12, 13, 14, and 15 in point one. The key issue presented in our greater lesson context regarding testing in the Christian life is the source and the result of each of the three areas of testing in this passage. That's verse 12, 13, then 14 and 15. For example, testing in the Christian life, here are three areas. Testing in the Christian life, it can be by God, it can be by Satan, or it can be by lust of the sin nature. And they have different results. If your testing is by God and you, you take it to the finish line, right? Undeserved suffering to the finish line or, or, or however, however the, whatever race he set before you in Hebrews 12, whatever race he set before you, when you finish the race, you don't, listen, winning is finishing. I don't care how many times you stumble and fall, you get back on your feet and you run to the end of whatever you're into, whatever, whatever race been set before you. And if you do, then you're going to be rewarded. First Corinthians three, 10 through 13, or maybe 15, 15. He says, if you have the foundation of salvation in Jesus Christ, then you build upon that a reward system. The divine judgment of God called fire will determine whether it's good and can withstand the test of divine grace and justice and all of that. And if it stands the test, if it's wood, hay, and stubble, it will be burned up. If it's carnal, if it's fleshly, if it's worldly, it's going to burn under, the, under divine judgment. If it remains through the fire, the fire produces something better than it was when it went through the fire. It gets purified. That's parazzo. Parazzo is a way to assess, ac to assess whether something is of great value by having it be tested for value. If God is testing you, not with evil, but if he's testing you with good, and all things work together for good, you, you've bought into that concept, and you run your race to the end, then it's going to be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ, and crowns will be given in addition to rewards. That's what we learned. By Satan, in verse 13, if it is by Satan, it is evil. It is not good. It is evil. And it results in destruction. Chaos and destruction. You can always tell when evil is working because it's chaotic. There's no order in Satan. No order in Satan. There's order in God and good, but not in Satan. Evil always develops chaos and destruction. In 1 Peter, this is really interesting. Go over to, go over to 1 Peter with me a moment. Put your eyes on this. 1 Peter 5.18. 5, 1 Peter. I'm moving. As, I'm going through Hebrews. I'm headed there. God lost my place in James. 5.8. Now, you know this passage. 
Be of a sober, be of sober spirit. I, I suppose we would say be of a sound mind. <laughs> be of a sober spirit. Be, be of a sound mind and be on the alert. Now, I'm going to let that set a minute. I'm going to let that set a minute. Who, who is supposed to be on alert? You are. You're supposed to be on alert. And here's why, why he, what you're alert for. In other words, one night, they said, I don't want to alarm you. But there is a, a there is a we're we're looking for a criminal in your neighborhood that just shot somebody, and we've chased him out of such and such an area, and we think he's in your area, and so we're gonna we have a backwoods area at my place. We're gonna search that, but I want you to be aware. Lock up everything, and we're gonna search your backwooded area. It's. It's pretty thick and it's woody and there's a valley in it and all that stuff. You know what they just did for Jane and I? Well, for Jane, it scared her half to death. Uh, and for me, I, I wasn't scared because I had to be the man. I, I had to be the man. Uh, had she not been home, I'd have, it, I'd been climbing up the walls instead of Jane. But, you know... Since she's climbing, I couldn't get there. She had all the wall space taken. But what they did for me and Jane was put us, put us on alert. We knew why we were being alert. We knew what we were being alert for. And we knew that for a relative time, we were in pretty good safe hands with uh, several policemen out searching. By the way, they never found him. I'm glad I answered the door and not Jane when they said, we haven't found him. Because <laughs> when I went back in, Jane said, how is it? I said, everything's good. Because that's the only way I knew we would sleep that night was everything was okay. But see, alert, alert. I don't know what you mean by alert here, but alert means, well, well look what he says in the rest of the verse. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a lion, a lion, like a lion. Watch this, what he's doing. Seeking someone, anyone, <laughs> to devour. You know what's interesting about this Greek word? I put it on your paper, and I'm going to explain it to you. Well, I, I think I did. You know what this means? It means to eat you in pieces. He prowls around seeking someone to devour, and it's going to be a slow, painful way to go. He, I don't want to go through it, but, you know, piece by piece. Not going to eat you one big gulp. He's going to take you. He's going, to dis, he's going to dismantle you piece by piece by piece by piece and enjoy his meal. Now, how do you like that picture in your head? Is that a pleasant thought for you? Oh, I think I'll just have dinner with him. No, if you go with him, you'll be his dinner. Now, he'll tell you, let's go eat dinner together. I got a little extra money. We'll go to such and such a place. It'll be the night of your life. Oh, it'll be the night of your life. That's an interesting word, devour. Because you have no idea how you're going to be eaten alive. That's the devil, and that's what evil does. And you need to be what? Alert. Okay. You know, there's a good warning. There's a good warning. Now, the old, and that's what we're talking about today. When we come to the sin nature next week, we'll talk about it in verse 14 and 15. It involves a process of being drawn away, enticed by lust to sin, and sin brings death. 
There's quite a chain of events that goes on in your life. We'll talk about that next week. Satan, point number two, Satan tempts believers by solicitation to evil, by cunning deceit. Think about that. If you're old enough, you've had this happen to you. If you're old enough, I mean, if you're over, I don't know anymore, could be 10. Could be 10. But I'm, I'm giving you a break saying 25. If you've ever been had by cunning deceit, you, you know the backlash to that, how bad that makes you feel, and how bad you feel about yourself for being so stupid. See, that was a prodigal son, wasn't he? I mean, that was the prodigal son all over again. When it dawned on him, all they wanted from me was my money. All my friends wanted was what I had. And when I didn't have any more, I had no more friends. I had pigs. That's who they were to begin with. God just lets you live in the reality of what you didn't know for sure. Listen to this verse, 2 Corinthians 11. I talked about this the other night to one of my studies. I don't remember if it was Tuesday or Wednesday. When God said, I'm a jealous, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? God's a jealous God. You know what? He, and I talked about this the other night. You know what? He, you know what God is jealous over? The covenant relationship that you have with God through his son, Jesus. And listen, we should all have a godly jealousy over any covenant relationship we have. You can always tell when it's godly because it doesn't make the other person feel uncomfortable. That's jealousy. That's a sin. And here he tells you why. He said, why God has a godly jealousy for us in Christ. Because this, and this is Paul speaking. For I, Paul, betrothed you, church at Corinth, to one husband. He performed the wedding. He performed the wedding. I betrothed you to Christ. The church was the bride. Christ was the bridegroom. And Paul brought them both together, brought the unbeliever to Christ and married them into a covenant relationship. That's what Paul talking about. And Paul says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. Just like God. And it disturbs him that they're going after false gods, that they're breaking covenant relationship with God, and it pains Paul to see that happen. The Jews have gone back to their old ways, and the Gentiles have gone back to their old ways, and their old ways are not acceptable. They broke covenant relationship with God, and they've gone off like the prodigal son. I betrothed you to one husband, Jesus Christ, so that to Christ I might present you a pure virgin. How about that? I don't know where you are in this whole immoral society we live in today. But I can tell you one thing. That in Christ, you're a pure virgin. Not in the world, necessarily. But in Christ. Oh, you missed this. If I was you, I'd, I'd pay attention to this one. I betrothed you to one husband so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. Do you grasp that? That's that wedding ceremony. You know what? You know what does that? That covenant relationship. The covenant relationship. Isn't that wonderful? I, I remember. Well, it don't matter. 
I am, but I am afraid that as, but here's what he's afraid of. I am afraid that as the serpent, that's Satan, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, that's what we call cunning deceit, by his craftiness, your minds, look where he targets. Listen, your minds, not, your, not the soul, that's secured. Minds, our minds might be led astray. Look, here's Peter. Here's Peter. His soul belongs to Jesus. His soul belongs to God in Christ, right? Satan got his mind. Satan got into his mind. A minefield in the angelic conflict. A minefield in the angelic conflict. It sets right above your shoulders. Just above your shoulders is the minefield in the angelic conflict. As serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, our minds might be led astray from the single-mindedness of devotion to Christ. Single-minded. You know, we talked about this the other day with James. A single-minded, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. A single-minded man is stable in all of his ways. You understand the difference? That's a pretty powerful idea. Solicitation to evil on page two, on my, at least on mine. Solicitation to evil is designed to get the believer, now listen to me, in his mind, to get him to think and act against the revealed will of God in your life. Now, every person in here, he's working different. Every person in this room, he's working you differently. He's working you. But, he, but listen, he's working you. He's working you just as sure as little green apples. He's working you. Ah, oh, he's working. He's working. What's he doing? Prowling for what? Consumption. He wants, to, he wants to eat you piece by piece by piece. It would be a long, painful death. Solicitation to evil is designed to get the believer to think and act against the revealed directive will of God. Matthew, the 16th chapter, 21 through 23. Jesus Christ says to his disciples, I must go to Jerusalem. I must suffer at the hands of the religious leaders. I will be killed by them, and on the third day I will rise from the dead. Peter said, could I have a word with you? Well, Peter, I, I, I'm in a Bible study. I know it won't take long, Lord. I just feel it's important. I need to speak to you. All right. Take a, take a five minute. This is not for you. Take a five minute. This is for the story. Take a five-minute recess. Takes him off the side. Peter takes him off the side and rebuked him. I've met a lot of people in this world I would never take aside and rebuke. And I had enough sense to know it. <laughs> that would not be a good thing to do. So you might as well just swallow it not say it. He takes him aside and rebukes him. And Jesus says this famous line to him, get behind me, Satan. Listen to this. You've become a stumbling block to me. And for you, you've become a stumbling block to me. Here's what your evil has done. Get behind me, Satan. Here's what your evil done. It's become a stumbling block to me, what I've got to do. And here's what it's done to you. Do not have mind. Do not put your mind on things. You have not put your mind on things of God, but on the things of men. See, it's where you put your mind. Jesus taught a Bible study. They don't put their mind on it. Put their mind on it everywhere, but Jesus said, 
Jesus laid that out, and Peter's mind went off rail, just like many of yours, went off rail. Mm -hmm. Went off rail. And now absolutely thinks that he has a responsibility to correct the greatest teacher that ever lived. In the word of God. You talk about a guy who's gone off rail and out of his mind. When you go off rail, you go out of your mind. When you go off rail, your mind gets railed. And that's how evil, evil works. That's just exactly how it works. It's exactly how it works. He get, begins to think and then act against the revealed will of God. So what you need to do? Let me. What what are you required to do? Be alert. Jeez. I'll put a deacon back there with a a paper a pen. When you walk out, he'll put be alert on your forehead. Somebody will tell you. What's what what does it mean to be alert? Oh, I forgot. I don't know. Uh, I should have paid attention in class. Paul used Eve as an example. God made Eve without a fallen nature, without a sin nature, living in perfect environment with God as her Bible teacher. With only one adversary in the whole world with one commandment to obey. Don't eat of the tree and don't play with Satan. Now he's going to stop by after school. And he's going to say, would you come out and please, please play with me? And he's going to look like a little red riding hood. He's going to have a little basket. And he's going to have that funny dance. That's the clue. And don't play with him. We know how this turns out, don't we? Be alert. Be alert. There's a little girl running around. There's a wolf dressed as a girl saying he's little red riding hood. He has bad breath with big teeth. Be alert. Jeez. I mean, what is it going to take for us to be alert? How many times do we have to do this? Then the Lord said to the woman, What have you done? Who be? What have you done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Well, I guess we all know what happened to her. She wasn't alert. Just like you. Then he's eaten one leg and one arm, and now you don't know that you can make it. And if you don't get out of there, he's going to start on the other side. Someplace you got to be alert. Better to be alert when he comes along and it looks a little strange. But he says he's a little riding hood, so what do I know? He must be a little red riding hood. Be alert. There's a wolf dressed up like a girl. Says he's a little red riding hood. Stay away from all little red riding hoods for this day. <laughs> I don't know. Three. Satan has schemes and reconnaissance. Here's military. He has military schemes and reconnaissance designed to take advantage of each one of us, to get us to act and think against the revealed will of God. Second Corinthians, the second chapter, verse 11, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan. We are not ignorant of his schemes, his military tactics. 
in 2 Corinthians 2, 5 through 11, which working off from 1 Corinthians 5, where you have sexual immorality going on in the church, and the church knows it and is condoning it with their silence. Are you with me? What they were doing was flaunting it publicly. We should never, ever cooperate when people flaunt their sin in our face. As if it's acceptable and right and just. And he calls the church out. He said, you're going to mess around and you're going to get disciplined in his sin. And you need to correct your way and call an ace an ace. That's the ace of spades. That's the ace of hearts. That's the ace. You call it what it is. You don't let them flaunt it and get away with it. You tell them what it is and how to correct it. Reconnaissance. Reconnaissance. The Lord said that this is Job. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Now listen, we know he's a prowler. Where have you come? Satan answered, from roaming about on the earth, walking around it. That's prowling. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? You know who Job is? He describes him. This is a description of super grace, spiritual maturity. You want a good definition of spiritual maturity? God gave it to you. He taught this Bible class. God taught this Bible class. I didn't teach it. He taught it. Here's what he says. Have you considered my servant? My servant. Have you considered my servant? That's a, listen, we all should strive to become the place where God says, that's my servant. Have you considered my, and he describes super grace status. He's blameless. He's upright. He fears God, and he turns away from evil. He turns away from evil every time. He turns from evil every time. He turns from evil because he is blameless, upright, and has a reference for his covenant relationship with God through Christ. He shuns, he turns away from evil every time. As Tony said today, you turn from what to what? We talk about this all the time. Turning from what to what? Giving up this for what? Have you, and, and listen, listen, he blames God. Listen, this is typical blame God. Listen, he says, does Job fear God for nothing? I mean, you know why Job's uh, motivated to trust you? It's because you just, you got him blessed. Who wouldn't? Listen to what he says. Here's how he describes it. And for one time, every once in a while, he can speak the truth. He said to God, remember, he's blaming. He's blaming God for putting a hedge around him. Here's how he describes the hedge that God has around every one of us. He says, have you not made a hedge around his house and all that he has? Now, what he has could be some distance from the house. It could be kids working out in the pasture. It could be kids living in another state. A hedge around his house and all that he has on every side. Boy, there's a reconnaissance. You see the reconnaissance? You have blessed the works of his hands. And his possessions have increased in the land. Let me tell you, prosperity overflow affects a nation. Bob called it blessings by association. See, I know that when I go to Chick-fil-A every day of the week. I don't walk around with a sign saying you're blessed because I'm here. 
Because that's not my point. You're blessed because God is here. You're blessed because God is here. I'm going to be sure of that. I know that. I know blessings by association when God shows up. In the parable, listen, in the parable, this is, I want you to look this up this week. In the parable of the tares, that's old school. I don't know what they call it anymore, but old school, it was called the parable of the tares and the wheat. This is in Matthew, the 13th chapter. I don't think it's on your paper. I don't know. You got Matthew 13, 38 and 39? No, that'd be well worth your time to put it there. In the parable of the tares, it's, it's one of those that's explained. In the parable of the tares, wow, I'm over time. Wow. In the parable of the tares, the enemy who sowed the tares is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age. What is interesting is the word devil is ho diabolus. That's where we get diabolic from. Cosmos diabolicus. I got to quit. I didn't realize. I didn't realize until everybody started leaving. I don't realize how late it was. I got to quit. All right, you can read, you can read point four. Let, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these. Father, this tenant uh, time just loses my mind uh, uh, focused on it when pe- people are so attentive to the Word of God. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God. Uh, we're being tested by Satan. We need to be on alert. He's prowling around to consume us piece by piece until he dismantles our life completely. Uh, the functional life for God. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this word of God to our souls. In Jesus' name, amen.